I think our final speaker needs no introduction. I'm going to assume that um, Dr. Dagan is actually probably the reason a lot of us are in this room today. At least I know it's the reason I'm here. Um, I was inspired by his work with the AAAS. Um, he's got a really seriously impressive CV, which I'm going to truncate to things that I find, think are germane to this event, just in the interest of time. Um, but first, because I'm just out of it, out of academia, I think I have to say this. Um, Dr. Dagan holds a PhD and an MSc from the University of Chicago in Evolutionary Biology and a JD of the University of California Hastings Law, focus on international trade, something like that. Uh, Dr. Dagan uh, currently serves as the co-founder and CEO of X Labs that is seeking to bring, a, um, let's say, the disruptive and um, grand challenge approach to um, global conservation efforts to help speed them up um, and increase their scale. Uh, he's also at wrapping up a year as uh, Duke University's Rubenstein Fellow to help the university engage in global grand challenges. Prior to this, he served as the first dedicated chief scientist to USAID in 30 years, something like that, uh, where he, together with Raj Shah, transformed the agency by putting science technology um, back in its core. And during this time, he helped develop, um, conceptualize, and create the U.S. Global Development Lab. Um, which has supported, I think, hundreds of innovators and hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, so I think this is really the perfect person to, to end this event. Um, that's all I'll say. Thanks, Alex. All right, who's ready to drink? I th <laughs> the, um, uh, of all the things I did at USAID, uh, probably the most important thing I did was bring back the AAAS fellows. Uh, because it is fun and put fellows actually at the front lines of development and and I think you've heard some of those fellows speaking today uh, that are doing incredible incredible things uh, and it is fundamentally not about processes and systems and clearance and it is about people that bring fundamental change and the one thing that you know about crowdfunding crowdsourcing uh, open innovation is it's fundamentally about people right so I'm gonna uh, present an entirely discombobulated talk on uh, a whole series of random thoughts I had while sitting in the audience so I hope you guys will uh, bear with me uh, some of it uh, most of it probably will not be applicable uh, today but let's 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 start off uh, and the, the the has anyone here read the Mars trilogy uh, can I see a show of hands, just, just so many people? Um, this will be part of, part of our thinking. Uh, it is by Kim Stanley Robinson, won a whole bunch of awards, probably the best example of hard sci-fi uh, that, that I personally love. And it is really about the fundamental, what happened on Earth with the exhaustion of natural resources and what it took for the colonization of Mars. And we talk about moon shots, and I, I would suggest perhaps we should talk about Mars shots. Right? Because what you are doing are engineering for essentially a new planet, a new world, a whole new set of constraints that are out there. Um, we all had these great imagine, imaginations of the future. Um, my, my view of the future sometimes gets a little darker. Uh, I don't see us in that. And in fact, when I, was, when I came to USA, that's actually the argument I made for creating the Grand Challenges program, creating prizes, creating the Global Development Lab was, um, I didn't see a future for how our agency was going to actually play a role in solving global development problems. The other thing I just want to point out is we are a week away from the back to the future date, right? So we should expect some pretty goddamn off awesome things as a result, and we're not gonna get it through our traditional procurement systems, right? I mean, I, maybe, maybe fusion, uh, but like, I, I love fusion, it's always the technology of the future because it's in the future, but like it is, it is incredible, I think, what you can do with prizes and challenges. And the reason is we have, as Ku pointed out today earlier in a presentation, we have an enormous set of challenges, right? 9.6 billion people by 2050, doubling of inputs, doubling of water. Uh, and, and what happens when people in the developing world want things like meat and dairy, right? And what it means is unless you fundamentally re-engineer plants in terms of photosynthesis and to decrease, increase their productivity and decrease their environmental footprint, it is clearing the, the Amazon and clearing the Congo Basin. Both of those are gone. So for me as a conservation biologist, this whole idea against technology that conservation has had 
uh, sort of historically can't work anymore. Uh, we know emerging infectious diseases are spreading at unprecedented rates. Uh, what's really interesting is we're seeing this in wildlife. We're seeing this in sea stars. We're seeing uh, wasting disease. We're seeing funguses that are literally wiping out species of frogs to the extent that the Smithsonian in Panama, at the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute, is pulling every live frog it can find within the areas we have chytrid and putting them into shipping containers <laughs> because that's what it will take to actually preserve this species. Right? We have to rethink how we're going to address these problems. Huge problems of water, and particularly we see this out in California, but, but, but you see it in Iran, you see it in, in many countries, uh, you see it in the Nile River Basin, you see it in the Mekong Basin, uh, you know, and water is fundamentally about food. And, and again, we get that issue as the bottom billions emerge, what does that mean? Huge problems in terms of energy, and again, what happens when people want air conditioning? And the fact is we think about development, and we think about small-scale farmers. Right? And, and the one criticism I've always had of USAID and, and Gates on small-scale farmers is that actually isn't our future in development. We've hit that tipping point of 50% of the world's population in cities. We don't think about the development challenges in cities. We think of that person in, the, in, in those individual environments. But at the same time, they still don't have access to electricity. They still don't have access to energy. They still don't have access to sanitation. Conservation. You know, this is my field. Uh, Society for Conservation Biology was, was created 30 years ago. The National Forum that actually coined uh, the term biodiversity at the National Academies was, was about 29 years ago. We're about to launch the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, how have we been doing? Well, if you look at the number of protected areas in the world, we're doing great. We've had this huge increase in the number of protected areas. We have made parks everywhere. But if we actually look at the impact of those conservation programs, every indicator we have suggests we're in the middle of a sixth mass extinction. We are losing species um, in places like Madagascar, where 80% of the species are endemic, uh, before we even know they exist. Um, this is, these are four new species. These are full-size adults that uh, were found in Madagascar in 2012. 80% of the forest is gone, right? So what have we already lost in a place that created the cure for childhood leukemia? And we know that it's not only a deterministic pressure of habitat destruction, but it's also the fact of the chance effects that we see and the deterministic effects of climate change, of wildlife trade. This is, this is, uh, this is my partner, and we're, we wandered into a mall that happened to be a mall that sold wildlife trade products. Um, each of the small, uh, those are all, this one store just sells shark fins. There are probably 30, 40 more stores like it. And each of those bags could be easily 1,000 uh, shark fins of a small shark or, or, or 30 to 40 of a larger shark. They also had whale shark and basking shark fins. And this is just one store within the place. So if we look at how we've solved these problems in development, we're top down. It's a tyranny of experts where the experts are defining both the problems and the solutions. It's closed, it's siloed, risk adverse. Um, conservation is technophobic. It's the most depressing field you could ever be in. Uh, probably one of the things I remember is waking up one morning at my field site and they were burning the tree next to my tent. And there weren't any other trees around us. Uh, and, and so, you know, and it's backwards looking. And we actually need to be forwards looking. And the challenge is, even with all the money we have, in development, and we take all the money together of all the major foundations, all the major institutions, we put it together, it's 10% of what we need to be able to solve the major problems in conservation and development. So we gotta be smarter about how we solve these problems. We've gotta actually figure out how do we use ingenuity and entrepreneurship in fundamentally new ways. They asked me to talk about a little bit about my own experience from the fellowship and how I got to USAID. And I'll just run through it quickly. Uh, the most lovely place on earth, Madagascar, is a place where myself and actually another fellow, uh, Barbara Martinez, uh, spent three years trying to understand why do certain things go extinct while other things survive. And the one trend you'll see in all the places I worked, I started working abroad by working in Russia um, at the fall of the Soviet Union, was I, I, I believe it's really important for us to do a couple of things. One is to take risks. And, 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 and ourselves 
in how we think about things. And the other one is to run to places that are in the midst of change, to run to places where there are really big problems. Because in those places, I find that you can actually have an unbelievable impact in terms of what you're trying to do. Um, so I came out of Madagascar, seven days out of Madagascar, I'm sitting in Chicago, uh, eating a bowl of Cheerios and opening up the TV and seeing 9-11. Uh, and I sat in that chair for the entire day until 11 o'clock that night, tears streaming down my face. I used to live in New York City uh, and vowed that, um, turned down a job at Yale and decided that I was gonna do this awesome thing called the AAAS Fellowship that had inspired me from my first year at graduate school where I was terrified because I had come from law back into science. Uh, and three months into the fellowship, uh, to Sage Russell's great consternation, uh, ended up in the Coalition Provisional Authority, uh, mainly because I was disgruntled with my office. But it was, it was an amazing opportunity to actually think about how do you redirect former weapons scientists and what I realize is fundamentally about how do you actually rebuild science within a country? And one of the things we got to work on was this thing with a guy who's now the chief data officer of the United States, DJ Patel, uh, was the virtual science library for Iraq. The lesson there was this was a collaboration of people across agencies who are all AAAS fellows who found the way to actually make something work by bringing, bringing your networks together in a fundamentally new way. The experience in Iraq allowed me to do something really cool, which was to build the first national parks in Afghanistan. Uh, and um, it was amazing because the places we were working, which were up, up in the Pamirs, uh, sort of in the northeast of the country and in the central, the central regions of the country, um, these were literally the trails of the Silk Road that Marco Polo him, himself took. Uh, through the regions. In fact, the, 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 the giant mountain sheep that are there are called the Marco Polo sheep. We actually did the first wildlife surveys in, in 30 years. We ended up building the first national park. We ended up not realizing we actually were building governance when we were doing that and building the second national park. And then it really evolved into thinking about how does science work to connect us to other countries? And how do we actually use science and conservation and other ways to disrupt how we traditionally do diplomacy. Why should frickin' political scientists actually have ownership over how we do diplomacy? Because quite frankly, science gives us a culture that cuts across ethnic groups, religions, whatever we needed. Um, and with the beginning of this administration, started working with Dennis Ross and Richard Holbrook on actually using science to engage Iranians um, around the world, which led to some of the breakthroughs that, that we saw there. The Global Development Lab was another example. So we had written transition papers on how science can be used to improve uh, diplomacy, but we had also suggested perhaps USAID could use a reinjection of science. At some point uh, in aid in 1990s, what happened was the Soviet Union fell apart. Uh, aid was very unpopular. It's never popular to give, a money, give away money that doesn't go to Americans, uh, American taxpayer money. They took the agency from tens of thousands, from, from 20,000, 18,000 people down to two or 3,000 people. And all that expertise actually left the agency. And we, and we lost a great deal of science expertise. By actually, most of the people who were running the science offices at USAID were former fellows. And that's why the AAAS Fellows Program was the very first thing I actually did was to try to bring more fellows back into that agency. Because those people, you then stay on. You then have impact. You then lead and initiate new programs that fundamentally change the trajectories of an agency. And I think that's, that's really important. I started the Global Development Lab with no budget and no people in a cubicle on the third floor. Uh, it was miserable to start, but, but you don't have to be limited by what anyone tells you. And in fact, the worst thing we tend to do is put limits in front of ourselves that aren't actually there. You should be the last person to do that, ever. It led uh, four years later into Hillary Clinton launching the Global Development Lab. Um, and it really leads, and it was fundamental into uh, that process, into a lot of what I'm trying to do now. And that process was really on how do we fundamentally create new pathways for development? Why do we have to have developing countries follow the pathways that we take, right? What is the equivalent? of the cell phone or, or you know, we don't, 
records are lovely. You now have Apple Music, which gives you 30 million songs rather than carry around you know, five or six million records with you. I think it's, it's perhaps much improved. So how do you do this for, how do we apply this to global development? And we've got this incredible thing, this democratization of science and technology that has actually leveled the playing field around the world particularly as cell phones are spreading and giving people access. We know about the power of the exponential in terms of computers. Synthetic biology, right, where it was, it was uh, $2.7 billion in 13 years to sequence a single composite genome of a single individual. And we've got something like the Illumina, which allows us to do it for a thousand bucks in four hours now. And we've got this merger of biology and technology that I think is really unbelievably powerful. The ability to program biology. Um, and you've got competitions like the International Genetically Engineered Machines competition, which used to be postdoctoral teams at MIT and Berkeley and is now high school students from really, really, really smart high schools, creating new products that don't involve cows but actually produce milk, except without brucellosis, without cholesterol, without lactose, without the inhumane nature of meat production that's out there. We've got new tools that allow us to create decentralized manufacturing and iterative manufacturing and prototyping, perhaps that allow us to deal with the issues that we're losing coral reefs due to acidification, perhaps that allows us to print new organs that are out there. We've got unbelievably cheap sensors, and this is a lot of the stuff I was teaching at Duke. We would actually ask the students to build new sensors and build new companies uh, and build new programs, um, and we can create a connected ecosystem. We can create what my friend Shaw Selby calls an internet of earth things to help monitor the earth in real time because quite fundamentally, if you can measure it, you can improve it, right? We've got new sensors from drones and we've got great tools like Planet Labs, which was set up by, I think three years ago by a couple of NASA uh, engineers who, were, who are, no older than anyone else in this room that realized that for $50,000 in a constellation of 150 of these satellites, we can actually have three meter resolution of the entire planet every day, right? 17K to put each one up into space. The incredible thing is instead of spending 20 years to build Landsat 8, right, with 20 year old technology by the time it goes into space, every two years they can put up a new one and iterate based on consumer advances in design. We can fundamentally rethink how we do that. Cell phones are driving that trend and they are platforms, they're sensors, they're ways of overcoming massive uh, barriers in terms of infrastructure destruction. Uh, and by the way, this is an area where the developing world was far ahead of where we were, right? We got Apple Pay in 2014, they had it uh, and its use in East Africa in 2007. And maybe they're microscopes, maybe they're new ways of getting education. And all of these sensors give us incredible new data whether to actually do a better job of disease surveillance or to figure out uh, fundamentally if, you're, if your daughter is pregnant or not because of the coupon she gets from Target. Um, I guess I was asked to actually talk about grand challenges. And my favorite, my favorite grand challenge, of course, is saving lives at birth. And, and uh, Deep actually, I think, gave uh, an example from it. It was fundamentally about this idea. We think about, in global development, about building hospitals with drugs and doctors and all those things that we really love. But we can't afford to do that. We don't have enough money in the West to build government public hospitals for everyone in the developing world. We, there just isn't. It isn't there. We should be more committed, but we aren't. So the question is, in the absence of that, how do you ensure everyone has access to healthcare, whether in a hospital or a hut? How do you make the distinction between that irrelevant to the level of care that you actually get, particularly if you're a pregnant woman and the period of time between the onset of labor and 48 hours after delivery? How do you make that totally irrelevant to whether you survive and whether your child survives? And that was the purpose of saving lives at birth. It's been $50 million over five years. It was our 10 million, everything we did at aid, by the way, was leveraged. Uh, everything was done in partnership. So we put in 10 million, we were able to raise $40 million. That is a great story to tell Congress. That is a great way to mitigate risk in what you're trying to do. 2,000 applications, 3% funding rates. I mean, which is, it's actually harder to get one of these grants than it is an NSF grant. 
Um, and then we would actually share the best ideas, whether or not we had funded them with other donors, other people at a science fair. And we had some really innovative ideas that did come from those other sectors. The Odon device, which, which Deep talked about, which came from a car mechanic in, in, um, it, from Argentina. The Pratt pouch, which eliminates the cold chain for antiretroviral drugs. And if you give those drugs to a mother before birth, it actually prevents the passage of HIV or reduces the passage of HIV between mothers and child, right? store for up to a year. You can get it to those last mile communities developed by a group of undergrads in a class at Duke. Uh, bubble CPAP in terms of greatly reducing the cost of ma uh, machines that provide continuous airway pressure. Again, developed in the design kitchen at Rice University, uh, developed by undergraduates. And these are not just great ideas, they're now being scaled up worldwide. Um, and I think that's important. And it's part of a larger, way that we need to rethink science. And we need to fundamentally also rethink tenure promotion and the incentives and in how universities work because that's a thousand year old model that's just, it's come to the end, right? <laughs> so open source drug discovery created a community of 6,000 people from 130 countries, including 70% of which who came from pharma that developed new license free TB and malaria drugs. And we've got this incredible new way of funding things. And Sure, you know, maybe it's pr providing a better uh, cooler for your tailgate party, but quite frankly, uh, it's increasing at 167% a year, and it's already surpassed the budget of NSF, and soon will surpass the budget of NIH. It's, it's a way to get away from philanthropy and traditional constraints and to really start thinking about those Mars shots that we have. And we can harness the crowd for ideation, for prizes, for creativity, for actually how we crunch data and analyze data to actually improve or design or come up with products or, or use citizen science to monitor the earth or actually ultimately fund it. And what's really important is not enough just to come up with those innovations, but how those innovations actually go big, right? Um, and, and in development, we haven't been that successful in doing so. So at USAID, my original vision for the Global Development Lab, and I, they're on a different path, but the original vision that was out there was that we source three, four, five thousand innovations over ten years. That a hundred of those, over the course of the ten years, we would take to some meta level of scale. And two or three of those would reach global impact. And people go, well, well, if you have 3,000 innovations and you only have three succeed, you have 2,997 failures. But in 50 years of aid, we've had perhaps five successes. The smallpox vaccine, the render pest vaccine um, are examples of those, you know, improved seeds that have come out of the green revolution. We haven't had that many successes. We talk about failure because we don't acknowledge failure. We don't acknowledge that many of our programs don't actually result. And we, because we don't acknowledge failure, we don't have the ability to learn from failure and to iterate. And so how do you build that into your processes? And how do you actually get people to understand? You know, potentially, it's every dollar we spend at aid, I would remind people is a dollar we weren't spending on a vaccine. So we do have to mitigate risk. Someone taught me that entrepreneurship is fundamentally about the mitigation of risk. How do you do so in a wise way? in terms of what we're trying to do. We set up a great program called Launch, which was a partnership between NASA, Nike, USAID, and State. What was kind of extraordinary is we used to, do, it was called Launch because we'd do it at the space shuttle launches. We could get anyone to show up for a behind the scenes tour of the space shuttle. Anyone in the world would come for three days to be able to help some innovators. And we'd ask them to leave the egos at the door. We'd use the power of awe and inspiration to get these people going. And then we would actually say, how do we tear apart what these people are doing and build it together and give them commitments of what actually gets these things to scale? Because if it doesn't get to scale, it's a failure. If it doesn't actually have an impact of 100 million people, it's a failure. Something that affects 100,000 people in India is a failure, right? So how do you actually make this thing have that? This is um, random advice I wrote up while sitting in the last section, but I was listening. Um, I found it incredibly, when I was in Iraq, I had a position, I was, a, I was the first State Department program there. When the coalition provisional authority was working on 
would tell me something wouldn't go, such as debathification. I had to redirect scientists that were all fourth party bath members. Uh, and they were all sitting at home without a salary. The Iranians were in town. Um, I speak Farsi, so I knew they were in town. And, and when I could, I would tell the CPA that this is a State Department program and we weren't subject to their rules. When State would tell me something wouldn't work, I'd tell them it was a CPA rule and we couldn't actually follow them and we were the sovereign government of Iraq. It was equally useful to have friends from other agencies who were doing things. St USAID fought heavily against the scientific integrity policy. It wasn't until I brought Alan Thornhill who created kind of the model policy at USGS in to actually talk to the leadership at aid that all of a sudden it broke through the barriers that were there. Um, you think of much of what, uh, so much of what happens in Silicon Valley I think is great, but a lot of it can be just thought of how do you provide someone better dinner reservations? Or how do I help you get the ingredients for your blue apron meal tonight? And, and what you guys are doing within Washington, within the federal government, within the places we're working, we have a chance to work on the world's biggest problems. Use that. Um, your actions, by the way, the very steps that you're taking within the agency actually create space for others. And the one thing I used to say at USAID is we are a catalyst, we are a cheerleader for other people doing great things, but probably the most important thing we could be is a customer service office. And I wouldn't forget sort of these fundamental roles for any of the change you guys are kind of leading. Um, when we did these really big challenges, the one thing I found was that we would source innovations that were already out there. Uh, sometimes we would find technologies that existed in adjacent areas and people would figure out new ways to apply it to what we're doing. When we ran Saving Lives at Birth time and time again over multiple years, we actually started getting really breakthrough ideas because people were then designing for the challenge. And I think that there is lifespans and changes that you see. Um, when we did a really crappy job of the procurement, when we did a really bad job around what we were trying to do and how we were trying to attract people, we got really bad stuff. Our first round of, of all children reading, which was new ways of trying to get 100 million new children reading, uh, in Africa was a complete failure because we let our procurement office take it over. Um, and I think ultimately it is not about the prize or the challenge or the new innovations, it's about that pipeline. It is about supporting people over those multiple uh, valleys of death that you have. It is your ecosystem or whatever you want to call it. Um, the, last, the last three things are kind of interrelated. Um, we talk about the risks of, of doing something, but I think a lot of it is actually the risk of failing to act. The risk of not taking an action, the risk of not innovating can be a far bigger risk for people, particularly when you're talking about lives at, at, at stake. The problem is we have incomplete information, so it's really hard to do it. Um, people are going to come up with all kinds of reasons, particularly practice. Well, we've always done it this way. And in fact, at USAID, we had something called the administrative... I can't even remember it, the ADS. I don't know, is there any aid people here that remember what that stands for? So it's not, it's a rule book. Agency directive. Thank you. Uh, something like that, right? It's a rule book. It hasn't been published in the Federal Register, subject to comment, and put into the U.S. Code of Federal Regulations. Because of that, it can be changed. We can change it. So just because something's a practice doesn't mean it's right. Just because something isn't, if something isn't prohibited, you can do it. And the most important thing is you guys are fellows, you guys are people who are brought into the system as those agents of change. Make full use of it, plead ignorance, charge ahead, do shit, create shit, make it happen. And I think it would be, it's, it's amazing what you can get done. I was amazed every step of what I would suggest at USAID in the Global Development Lab and what we could actually get done because the mere act of leadership was really important. I want to just briefly talk about what CX Labs is. Um, for us, it is a series of Mars shots. You know, we want to figure out how do we actually replace protein uh, from traditional sources. Uh, how do we re-engineer coral for resistance against warming and acidification using synthetic biology? Um, how do we engineer the microbiome on a frog to actually defeat diseases like chytrid? 
Um, how do we create that internet or, or things? Uh, and we're starting by launching this set of grand challenges for conservation. The difference is we're, we're taking equity into the pieces, the things that we actually fund, and we're building the pipeline to actually get those things to scale. And that's, we really want to see, we want our success and our livelihoods tied to whether those things su succeed. Um, this isn't public knowledge, so this is not something that can be shared, but we're launching uh, in, in, a, in a few months what is called the Blue Economy Challenge, which is creating a blue revolution for the oceans, much as we've created, um, created for, uh, for uh, that was originally created for South, South Asia. Um, on the Green Revolution. And our funders behind this are the Australian government, which we've convinced to take this sort of first step. And again, the idea is it's not enough just the source, but it's how we develop, how we accelerate. But we're also thinking about how do we create the crowdfunding platform that would actually support innovations that are coming out of this. How do we use open innovation? We have a 501c3, so everything that we're doing within, within the 501c3 is actually done open product development, open hardware development, open citizen science and open source approaches. Shaw Selby, who's a Boeing engineer and National Geographic Explorer, is leading this effort. And one of our first tools that we want to create is harness this thing, this barcode of life initiative, spend $100 million sequencing uh, the CO1 gene for something, um, for lots and lots of novel species. Can we actually create the reader that allows us to, allows a child to understand what's in their backyard? Um, that allows Whole Foods to determine if that fish is really tilapia. Um, we're looking at creating, a, a, we're looking at building a tribe, because I think it's not enough just to run a prize, have an accelerator, have a fund, have a crowdfunding site. It's how do we fundamentally collect people that agree, that, that want to be part of this network, to recreate the future of conservation, what we call Conservation 3.0, right? What does conservation look like in the future if we actually bring in engineers and microbiologists and synthetic biologists and dreamers that, that want to figure out how we save the planet, harnessing exponential technologies? How do we bring the makers, which we've stolen this icon from, uh, specifically into, into this event? This is not BronyCon. I don't know if you guys actually know this. For some reason, Baltimore is like the world headquarters of furry conventions, and one of them are men who like to dress up as My Little Pony. That is a conference that actually happens in Baltimore. This is, this is, this is more serious. And this is why I think this idea, you know, these big ideas we have, um, how do we actually, you know, the earth is under this fundamental shift that's happening. We have the opportunity to colonize new planets. How do we harness technology to allow us to do this? How do we harness technology to solve every of the problems that you guys are doing? And, and my answer is, let's science the shit out of this. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much for that perspective. Um, I'm a conservation biologist as well, and one of the reasons I'm at AAAS is to try to expand um, the, the solution, um, how we think about solutions for conservation biology problems, which are immense. How do you work with, or have you engaged with uh, other NGOs, other wildlife organizations? What's, what's been the pushback or the acceptance of how you're viewing um, these new solutions to these problems? It, it, it's a great, it's a great question. Our partner is WWF, um, and they're a great partner. Uh, but like all organizations, all large bureaucracies, they, they have all the challenges of a large bureaucracy. They can be risk adverse. Um, they want, they, they've fundamentally redone their strategy for their organization to try to take hold of innovation, but they don't quite know what that means yet. And it's, same thing's true of the Australian government. And it's how do you actually show them examples, like the ones that we have seen here, give them the, lead them along that path to try to do some new things. Some things they just may not be able to take. WWF has a network that includes European partners that will never accept what we're doing on synthetic biology. My question is, do we want to see the loss of everything in the, in the Maldives or do we, and, and in, in Australia and in the Red Sea? Or do we want to actually find a way to engineer a solution?
that's potentially out there. Do we want to see the loss of the Amazon in the Congo Basin, because that's sort of what I see happening, or do we want to see new ways of coming up with protein that provide substitutes? I think it's hard. I think if you look at the conservation community right now, they're in a complete, um, they're really at a loss. CI has gone one way. Uh, WCS is pretty much, I think, on the same path that it's always been on. Uh, uh, Rare is trying some new approaches, uh, but they're still very small. TNC has become a financial uh, institution, perhaps even more, right? And as, and Peter, Kariva, has, who just left, has taken huge hits, I think, for the approaches he's put out. Um, so I don't, I think right now there's a great opportunity for leadership. And I think, um, but I think the challenge is I'm not going to be funded out of the traditional conservation community and the traditional conservation funders. And we've got to find a way to do it. And our goal is to become self-sufficient financially so we never have to go back to philanthropy. Other questions? Hi, I'm Jeremy Ward. I'm actually a congressional fellow with Senator Durbin this year. Uh, my question relates to your self-sufficiency. Uh, how do you, how have you gone about approaching institutions, businesses, whatnot, that are going to provide the funding for you to incorporate the challenges that you want? Or how do you earn profits that can support your future uh, challenges from the ones that you're developing? Uh, so there's a bunch of different ways. One is through the life. So we're, we're struggling with this right now. Um, one idea is do we actually support companies or do we purchase IP and build things ourselves? I really, one of the things we want to do is actually build technology ourselves as well as sourcing others. And Flagship Ventures in Cambridge is probably our inspiration for an organization that is a VC that both buys companies, buys IP, and builds things, and what comes in doesn't look like what's coming out. Um, I think what gets us money is getting things exited. Right, getting things exited into the private sector, getting things to scale, getting 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 contracts to, to be able to do that. How we're raising money? Well, one of the first things we're doing is we're convening kind of the world's um, biggest food companies, the CEOs of the major oceans conservation organizations, uh, policy leaders from the White House and from USAID and from 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 the World Oceans Commission. Uh, and we're bringing them all together on the beach in Scripps in November, because that's a really nice place to be, and spending a day designing what these challenges actually look like. And the hope is getting them excited like we got other people excited around the grand challenges. The, the hard part is it's a lot harder doing, I think, this in the private sector. It's a lot harder doing this. Even as a B corporation, there is an inherent distrust. Smithsonian. We have a couple of their really most innovative ocean scientists coming for us that the head of the um, Smithsonian Conservation Biology Institute recommended to us. And they couldn't, we were paying the hotels. Uh, they couldn't actually come because, because the invitation came from a B corporation. And they had no way of understanding. A B corporation is a social enterprise that the main goal is no, no longer just purely maximizing profits, but it's also the mission. Our mission is ending human-induced extinction. And I think um, we've got to create new models because philanthropy and NGOs are not going to actually solve these problems. Other questions? Hey. To piggyback on that a little bit, um, I'm slowly coming to the realization slash pushing against it that a lot of innovation and a lot of the uptake of these approaches relies on the commercialization aspect and relies on corporations and other people who will pay for these solutions. Um, and you may have dealt with this in the conservation realm um, and found some avenues there that may not have been immediately obvious. And my angle is social sector, and there are not a lot of commercialization opportunities in social sector. Um, so curious to hear what your experience has been in getting, kind of rethinking the model for sectors that have relied on NGOs and philanthropy and other non-commercialization options. There's a lot of great examples, actually, of healthcare organizations that are private healthcare organizations that are spreading through the developing world because people would rather pay something than have 
a lack of access to good care within the government hospitals. Um, and so there are models that the Social Entrepreneurship Accelerator at Duke uh, are spreading around the world where people are actually willing to pay for services. I think the second piece is, um, is this idea of where, understanding where is the cost. And do you know the recycle, have you, has anyone heard of Recycle Bank? Or know the Recycle Bank example? Um, a guy named Ron, I think his name is Ron Guerin, uh, who recognized that there were communities in Pennsylvania that were starting to opt out of recycling, right? They just thought it was way too expensive to actually pay for recycling. Um, he had a very simple innovation, which was to put an RFID chip into the garbage cans and an arm on the garbage trucks that identified the cans to a specific account or home and then would weigh the garbage, the recycling bins when the truck would pick up the recycling. What he got, the, 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 the county governments, the municipal governments to recognize was the fact that it wasn't the cost of the recycling that they needed to think about, it was the cost of paying for garbage trumps, trucks to drive across Pennsylvania and dump the, the trash that was mixed with trash and, and recycling into a dump. And he figured that, that that was actually far more than what the recycling actually costs. Because if you took away that cost, you were taking less, you were driving less trucks. You had less trucks moving, less drivers you had to pay for, less tip fees you actually had to pay for. And then the second piece of it was he incentivized commuters, commu uh, communities. So the more you recycled, that got measured, picked up by the RFID chip, weighed by that arm, you then got actually Starbucks gift cards or you got Walmart gift cards, which was far less than the price of actually running that program using these technologies and develop it. And he would get recycling rates up to like 70, 80, 90% in communities, which then actually made the recycling operations far more efficient and financially successful. So part of it is understanding who's paying for the cost. What we're also doing is thinking about what technologies have a conservation impact but also serve secondary markets. So we use the, the we're misusing the phrase of dual use because I hate the non-proliferation phrase of dual use because this table is dual use depending on what you do with it. But how do we actually think about how do we use new technologies that serve multiple markets and have a market that allows us to scale? Because without scale, we're not going to be successful and we're going to go out of business. Um, this sort of builds on a previous question, also your comment about the uh, Mars Trilogy. What is the role for artists in maybe helping to catalyze um, this new movement in conservation? Uh, it, it's a, it, that, that's, a, that's a really good question. And I think artists, um, I think one of the great things about prizes is they make the impossible possible, right? They, 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 and one of the things that artists can do is help us visualize, help us think about that, inspire us to think of, of what is the impossible that we actually want to make possible. One of the, um, one of, uh, one of, and, and fundamentally the previous person who asked a question about design, design is, is fundamental to all of this, right? Because that takes us back to people. And it just takes us back to people who are at the core of whatever we're doing. Um, I took out, because I had something like 150 slides when I started this presentation, I, I took out like 60 of them, and, uh, and although I probably had 50 too many, but the, uh, one of the things I had was a shovel because of this idea of appropriate technologies. We think of, we have a bias that actually may border on racism as to what do we think is appropriate for the developing world, when in fact it is, it's the same design principles you would use for designing a product for the developed world. What is your user? What is their education level? What is the cost? What is the environment? How are they gonna use this particular tool? It's asking the same sets of questions, but looking at it. It doesn't make any predictions or assumptions as to the level of the technology itself. It's whether how you apply it and how you've modified it is appropriate for the settings. So you can have world-class technology that's working like those cell phone-based microscopes that could be working within local settings. We could have a DNA barcoder that's working in Lusaka to help us actually with wildlife trafficking, um, as long as we design it well. And I think design is, 
is part of a continuum that includes art. And one of my dreams is to go to Baltimore, buy a big, ugly, old factory, and put half of it with artists and half of it with engineers. I think we'd have some pretty cool stuff. Yeah, I'm Cookie Hansen. I'm working in the Office of Representative Sam Farr. Um, have we just given up on Congress helping here, or do you have any advice for someone working in Congress, how we can help with this? Um, I haven't get, uh, so, so uh, the Republicans and the Democrats were both my biggest allies in setting up the Global Development Lab. And one of the things I was really grateful for, I spent the last year really on the Hill, uh, talking to staffers, talking to people. And what I found was that the very principles of innovation and entrepreneurship, which are the, the, the twin jets that have powered America to what it is, and for which we are fundamentally respected, right, are things that were, that, that were respected by both sides. Um, so I, the Global Development Lab, when we filed our congressional notification, it went through without a hold. And for you, if you understand, that's when I resigned, was the day that went through, my work was done. Because at that point, I understood that we had the support of the Republicans and the Democrats for this very idea that was fundamental to what we're trying to do. And I think, um, I think sometimes that we have a, sometimes I think, we make assumptions about both sides as to what is out there. It's not an easy atmosphere at all. It's probably the hardest it's ever been. But at least in this example, people were excited about what we're doing. And it just took sometimes phrasing language in different ways so people understood how it actually fit into their assumptions and, their, and the things that they cared about. People care about innovation and entrepreneurship on both sides of the aisle. Thank you, guys.